Buongiorno, eh, io eh, vi saluto, grazie di essere venuti come sempre tantissimi, questo è il secondo Darwin Day al Museo Pigorini, organizzato con Roma 3, è sempre un piacere avervi qua, sarò molto veloce perché la giornata è lunga, densa, importante, con divertentissime e importantissime comunicazioni, adesso do la parola al sovrintendente del Museo Pigorini, il dottor Francesco Di Gennaro, poi darò la uh, parola al professor D'Amico che è il... D'Angelo, che è il direttore del Dipartimento di Filosofia di Roma 3, e dopo di loro eh, Francesco Ferretti vi includerà velocemente la giornata e faremo, inizieremo con le dovute comunicazioni dei nostri ospiti. Grazie. Buon pomeriggio a tutti, anche da parte mia. Charles Darwin, dall'alto dell'eventuale tomba la scala evolutiva ci vorrà perdonare se abbiamo posticipato di tre giorni la sua commemorazione, che laddove nel 2013 interessò il tema della scienza, della fede e l'origine del concetto di religione, oggi riguarda la nascita del linguaggio. Il Museo Nazionale Preistorico e Etnografico Luigi Pigorini nel suo odierno impegno si conferma uno dei luoghi di elezione del discorso mondiale mondiale del Darwin considerato di attenzione dell'apparato espositivo e delle collezioni che sono molteplici e profondi, non solo riguardo il linguaggio verbale, cui si strettamente ci si riferiamo, ma anche in relazione a significanti che si prestano ad essere eletti come veri e propri linguaggi, dei quali citerò a titolo di esempio il linguaggio della decorazione della ceramica appenninica dell'età del bronzo della penisola italiana, cui da qualche tempo ci stiamo dedicando sulla base di numerosi reperti presenti in Italia. Se la capacità di dialogare con la voce rappresenta, come qualcuno sostiene, un requisito fondamentale, qualificante dell'uomo, si deve forse pensare che l'uomo è uomo solo da quando può litigare a distanza con il coniuge nella profondità della caverna? Da tempo si parla di Homo per forme alle quali nessuno attribuisce la capacità di linguaggio, ma certamente altri importanti elementi distintivi, comprendenti comunque la comunicazione. Su questi temi il dibattito è rigoroso, come ascolteremo dagli illustri relatori che abbiamo l'onore di avere qui con noi nella nostra sede romana. Avremo la possibilità di tornare sul tema delle capacità fonetiche del Neanderthal, questo progenitore, o forse no, che a me interessa molto perché abitava sotto di me, a Sacco Pastore. Si tratta di argomenti mai accantonati, da quando il nostro irrequieto festeggiato, uno che non si sapeva cosa avrebbe fatto da grande fino a quando è stato grande e poi grandissimo, li stimolò ancorandoli ad un rivoluzionario discorso sull'origine della specie, ma che oggi tornano all'attualità anche nei dettagli della meccanica cerebrale, così importante da capire per sviluppare cervelli finti, utili sì, ma ancora tanto stupidi, che ci aiutano in tutte le attività, compresa quella oggi ipertrofica, della comunicazione, che nell'ambito del linguaggio rientra. Ringrazio i curatori della giornata, Francesco Ferretti e Luca Bondioli, e la produttiva ormai familiare schiera dei suoi collaboratori, ma forse rischio di privilegiare la quota celeste in questo caso, visto essenzialmente che si tratta di studiose, che saranno i curatori a gratificare con l'opportuna menzione e che renderanno certamente vivo il dibattito. Voglio invece ringraziare il personale interno di ogni qualifica che in un ambiente reso sempre più difficile dalle ingiustificabili ristrettezze dispensateci, continua a mantenere uno spirito di corpo e ci consente con sacrificio di ripetere e moltiplicare le manifestazioni di eccellenza dell'Istituto. Grazie a tutti i presenti e buon lavoro.
E buonasera a tutti, come direttore del Dipartimento di Filosofia, Comunicazione e Spettacolo dell'Università di Roma 3, sono particolarmente lieto eh, di questa iniziativa che vede per la seconda volta una eh, proficua collaborazione eh, con il Museo Pigorini e eh, vede una partecipazione di pubblico eh, veramente eh, direi importante, imponente, considerando eh, anche la giornata semifestiva. Eh, non c'è bisogno di sottolineare quanto sia eh, sentito da parte di un dipartimento eh, come il mio il tema, eh, del, eh, il tema che verrà affrontato oggi. Eh, il tema dell'origine del linguaggio è un tema sempre affascinante, è un tema eh, che continua ad essere eh, aperto a, alle, alle soluzioni, alle proposte, è un tema che dopo un, un lungo, una lunga eclissi è tornato negli ultimi decenni a riproporsi con eh, basi scientifiche molto più solide, con il coinvolgimento di competenze di linguisti, di antropologi, eh, di eh, studiosi di eh, preistoria e, eh, credo che, eh, e di scienze cognitive. E credo quindi che le, eh, gli interventi di eh, quest'oggi eh, da parte eh, di alcuni tra i massimi esperti mondiali della questione, eh, certamente ci aiuteranno a fare un po' più di luce su un tema che resta eh, sempre, eh, non, sempre eh, con un alone di, eh, di mistero. Eh, ringrazio in particolare il professor Ferretti che ha eh, tanto ha fatto per organizzare questa giornata come anche la precedente, ringrazio naturalmente il direttore del Museo Pigorini che eh, ci ospita in questa bella sede e che ci mette a disposizione questo spazio eh, che, eh, e, e, e che ci accompagna in questa, eh, in questa serata. Buon lavoro a tutti, grazie. Allora io non rubo altro tempo alle relazioni, possiamo subito iniziare con Jan Tattersall, non dico niente nel presentarlo perché è noto a tutti voi che siete qui, a tutti noi, soltanto che i suoi libri bellissimi sono tradotti per la maggior parte anche in italiano e quindi leggeteli se ancora non li avete letti, se ancora non li avete letti e continuate a leggerlo e adesso ci racconterà lui eh, la la sua presentazione e poi toccherà a Dasper Bear, quindi invito Jan Tattersall a iniziare i nostri lavori. And it's such a great pleasure to be here, and I, I would like to start by thanking uh, my colleagues uh, Francesco Coletti and Luca Bondioli and all our hosts here at the Pigorini Museum for inviting me to come here to celebrate uh, Darwin Day with you in this really wonderful setting. Uh, they've put together a really, really interesting program for this afternoon, and I think you'll understand at the end how science progresses through disagreement, or uh, as we uh, call it, the testing um, of ideas. And please, please, first of all, accept my apologies for not being able to address you in your own beautiful language, uh, but we do have wonderful translation, and um, I will try to speak uh, uh, as slowly as I can, even though I know this uh, risks my getting in trouble uh, with our hosts here. Now, uh, let's see, can we have the, um, can we have the uh, PowerPoint on? Oops, okay, we, got, we have to open the program. Excuse me, one, oh, do you want to do it? Yes. Okay, great. So I should say while the, uh, while the PowerPoint is coming up here, that I'm, I'm a paleontologist. You know, I, I study fossils. And as yeah, it happens, I apologize, but it's better this, if this you one speak. Is, oh, it's not should, so well working. I can, I can speak into this if one. If you can, no can you yeah. speak si just down oh. here? So, you can speak I here. Think, uh, can you all hear me here? Yes. Yes. Do you think it's all right? Because right. so, uh, it's much better if I, I think. Oh, ah, okay. So, if go I closer up, to the I, microphone. If I can speak in the microphone, it shouldn't really be a problem. Uh, as I was saying, I, I'm a paleontologist. 
And um, as it happens, so I study fossils, and, and as it happens, Charles Darwin himself seems to have had a huge aversion to fossils, uh, certainly to human fossils. Um, let's see, let's start these slides going. And certainly, Darwin avoided talking about human fossils, even in situations in which you might expect uh, he would want to do. For example, as early as 1864, he acknowledged in this letter here, a private letter, that he had actually seen, and presumably even handled, the newly recognized Neanderthal skull from Gibraltar. Yet, he never ever said one more word in his whole life about this uh, amazing fossil which is seen here with its discoverer, uh, George Busk. Uh, similarly, by the time that Darwin published The Descent of Man in 1871, the original skull from the uh, Neanderthal, oops, sorry, I've got to go back, this is some shameless publicity, the original skull from the uh, uh, Neanderthal in Germany had already been a cause of great discussion and, and active debate for many years. Yet, in the entire two volumes of The Descent of Man, he only made one cryptic allusion to that specimen. And yet, at the same time, there's no doubt that Darwin was the single most important founder of the branch of science that deals with uh, the, uh, tries to understand uh, just how human beings came, became the extraordinary creatures uh, that they uh, are today. Darwin loved to hypothesize about human origins, and his particular interest was in the unusual behavior patterns that came to distinguish our modern species Homo sapiens. And of course, now that we have a very substantial material record of our evolution, there's no way of addressing questions like this without consulting our uh, fossil and our archaeological records. And that's something that I tried to do, again, shameless publicity, in my new book, I Signori del Pianeta. But before I, I embark on a quick tour of our fossil record, let me say something that I have learned always to say as kind of an insurance against um, misunderstanding. And that is that there can be no doubt whatever that we human beings are intimately integrated within the great tree of life that uh, unites all living things in the world today. And as this circular but nonetheless tree-like diagram we see here shows, the mammalian group to which we belong is an integral part of nature. It's not separate from it at all. And within this tree, of course, we lie very firmly among the primates, and especially among our closest relatives, uh, the great apes. But at the same time, at the same time as this, it's useless to deny that we're also highly distinctive in many ways. Some of these ways are physical, and they mostly relate in one way or another to our unusual bipedal form of uh, upright locomotion. And this is something that can be traced back to, uh, in the fossil record, to ancestors, remote ancestors, who lived uh, between about seven and four million years ago. There's uh, our bipedalism happening. And this new posture of ours seems to have been the stem adaptation of the hominid family that uh, underpinned everything else that was to come. But nonetheless, the thing that really makes us truly distinctive, and certainly the thing that makes us feel so totally different uh, from other living beings, is the unique way in which we process information in our brains. What we human beings uniquely do, it seems, is to use our minds to disassemble our experience into a huge vocabulary of mental symbols. And then we can recombine these symbols in new ways, according to rules, to produce alternative notions of the world around us. And the end result is that we human beings live very significantly, I think, in the world as we reconstruct it in our heads, rather than in the world that nature objectively presents to us. And this unique capacity, I think, shows in every aspect of our lives, every aspect of our experience. Uh, members of other species, I think, react more or less directly and 
with greater or lesser degrees of sophistication to the stimuli that impinge on them from the outer environment. But our symbolic capacity allows us to envision alternatives, to make interpretations, and to ask ourselves questions such as, what if? And what this means is that we're not just doing what other creatures do, only a little bit better. We really are uh, dealing with information in an entirely distinctive way. Now, perhaps there's no better way to gauge this uniqueness than by looking at the cognitive style of our closest living relatives, the great apes. And numerous observations, oops, there's our thinking style going on, oops, hitting the wrong buttons here, there we go. And numerous uh, observations suggest that uh, cognitively these relatives of ours are very complex things in, uh, indeed. I don't mean to demean the apes as cognitive entities at all. But although hardly a week seems to pass in which it is not discovered that uh, one ape or another does something that formerly we thought we only did, the cognitive gulf between us is, uh, is still evident, even though here we have a, uh, a chimpanzee cracking a hard nut on uh, an anvil using another stone. It's complicated behavior, but it's not uh, the kind of behavior uh, that, uh, that, that distinguishes us from everything else around. The cognitive scientist Danny Pavanelli has put the matter uh, this way. He says, chimpanzees rely strictly on observable features of others to forge their social concepts. They don't understand that other beings are repositories of private and internal experience. And whether you not or not you agree with those precise words of Polinelli's, his conclusion, I think, directly reflects the fundamental fact that for all of their considerable intuitive intelligence, the apes are not symbolic creatures in the human sense. They can recognize symbols, and when they're facilitated to do it in laboratory settings, uh, they can even add symbols together to make simple statements. But the additive algorithm is an extremely limiting one. And the upshot is that chimpanzees clearly do not remake the world in their minds as we routinely do. So the cognitive gulf between us, while it is narrowing all the time it seems, still remains uh, absolute. And yet, at the same time, there can be little rational doubt that we humans are descended from non-symbolic ancestors. Ancestors that were, in some sense, broadly ape-like in their co cognitive uh, attributes. As Pavanelli himself put it, in all, oops, I'm, we're going the wrong way again. In all likelihood, those ancestors were intelligent, thinking creatures, but they did not reason about unobservable things. They had no ideas about the mind, no notion of causation. And perhaps with the exception of that word thinking, this seems to be a reasonable general characterization of what the ancestral hominid uh, would have been like. And it certainly gives us a kind of anchor point as we begin to explore the many developments that took place along the way to Homo sapiens. But, of course, at the same time, it does challenge us to understand just how the amazing transition to symbolic reasoning took place, to understand how this transition happened. And it's important to get this answer right, because it inevitably conditions our own view of ourselves. So, was this transition something that occurred slowly, over vast stretches of time, under the guiding hand of natural selection as it operated on a long, long succession of ancestors? If it was of this nature, we might be justified in concluding 
that we have in some sense been fine-tuned by evolution to be the kind of creatures that we are. But there is also an alternative possibility. Might this transition instead have been a short-term event, an event that happened at some point, a definable point in our ancestry? And if that was the case, maybe there was some element of chance involved in the process of becoming the creatures that we are. Maybe we're not fine-tuned for anything by evolution. Well, the first indication that we have of uh, the nature of the process that produced us comes not from the, 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 the attributes of any particular ancestor of ours, but instead from the form of the human family tree itself. Here's one version of that human family tree, anchored at the very bottom by an ancestral species that, in cognitive terms, was broadly comparable to today's great apes. And the most obvious feature of this tree, as you can see, is that it is very bushy, with numerous branchings and coexistences. Clearly, what we're looking at here is a vigorous history of diversity and evolutionary experimentation among our precursors, rather than a, a linear grind from primitiveness to perfection. And perhaps equally significantly, this tree also shows just how unusual it is uh, for our species, Homo sapiens, to be the only hominid in the world. Typically, as you can see, several different hominid lineages uh, tended to have coexisted at any one point in time over the existence of the hominid family, but not today. And this stock fact, I think, is actually telling us something very significant about our species compared to every one of its uh, predecessors that we see in this tree. Well, in, in figuring out what was going on here, we do have the advantage that at some point early in their history, uh, ancient hominids began to leave material traces of their behaviors behind them. Uh, these traces first come in the form of African stone tools and activity sites that make up the early phases of the archaeological record. And they allow us to pick up the general pattern of increase in hominid behavioral complexity over time. And this pattern is extremely revealing. Because from the very first time of manufacture of uh, stone tools like this one, just sharp flakes bashed from one piece of rock using another, from this early time, innovation was exceedingly episodic. Tools like the one that we see on the screen here were first made and used to butcher uh, carcasses some two and a half million years ago by small-bodied hominids of extremely archaic appearance. These ancient hominids were certainly bipedal when they were on the ground, but they had short legs, they had ape-sized brains, and they had ape-like projecting faces, uh, as you see here. And they probably still depended on the trees for shelter as well as for sustenance. And they looked very much like, they would have looked very much like uh, you see them uh, depicted here, doing a whole range of things that uh, apes just don't do. And what is more, by the very act of spontaneously manufacturing stone tools, they show us that they had already moved significantly outside the ape uh, cognitive range. But even when a much more modern looking form of hominid finally appeared, at a little under two million years ago, stone tools of the old kind continued to be made. And this exemplifies a striking pattern that we observe among hominids. Namely, that new kinds of uh, hominid do not attend, tend to be associated with new kinds of tools. And here we see a recreation 
of this new kind of hominid. The very first hominid that had basically modern body size and proportions. It's called Homo agaster. And to begin with, it only used very simple flake tools of the kind that we saw uh, in the previous slide. But the anatomy of this form tells us that for the first time, hominids had completely emancipated themselves from the trees. The hominid that you see here was a tall, striding form that was committed to life out in the open savannah. And this was a brave move for our ancestors to make. Because even as they began tentatively experimenting with a, the, a new semi-predatory life way, these hominids were entering an ecological zone, a hazardous environment that teemed with voracious predators. And uh, probably, not uh, coincidentally, it was at this point that hominid brains started to expand significantly, as we see in this rather simple-minded chart that shows a strong upward inflection at about two million years ago. Now, brain is a metabolically expensive tissue, and its expansion must have been underwritten by a higher quality, a higher energy diet. And the most obvious source of such a diet was the carcasses of scavenged and hunted animals. Very, very different life way from the ancestral uh, ape style life way. Yet for all of the cognitive and social change that this ecological shift to an at least partly hunting way of life would surely have necessitated, we do not find a significant new kind of tool making technology in regular use until about one and a half million years ago. This innovation was the so-called hand axe, like the one that we see here. And this is a tool that was made to a standardized ideal that has to have existed in the mind of the toolmaker before stoneworking started. And it was a dramatic departure from the simple sharp edge that had been sought by the earlier stone tool makers. Clearly, we're looking here at evidence for a cognitive leap, again, of some kind. But, frustratingly, we don't know for sure what the other sequelae of this leap may have been. And although the implicit cognitive change here was obviously significant, we can't read any evidence of modern symbolism, any hint of modern symbolism, into the evidence we have. The manufacture of hand axes certainly requires sophisticated intuition, as anybody who has ever tried to make one of these things uh, knows very well. But probably it doesn't require anything more than that. And the same is even true of the very next development in stone tool making. This was the so-called prepared core stone tool, like the one we see here, whereby a stone core was shaped with multiple stripes on both sides until a final blow would detach what was effectively a finished implement, which is what you see in the front of this view here. Now this innovation was made a mere 300,000 years ago, or thereabouts, and once more it was made within the tenure of a more advanced looking member of our genus Homo. The new hominid involved was the form called Homo heidelbergensis, which showed up at around 600,000 years ago in uh, both Europe and in Africa. And its brain was in the size range of uh, modern human uh, brain sizes, although it was well below the modern human average. Still, Befitting its rather larger brain, Homo heidelbergensis was clearly a very crafty creature building the earliest known artificial shelters like the one that we see reconstructed here on the screen. On the screen. But again, despite these complex behaviors, there's nothing in the archaeological record that Homo heidelbergensis left behind to suggest that these hominids were manipulating information in the modern human manner. 
in the symbolic manner. Complex as their behaviors doubtless were, there's no reason to believe that at this time hominids were even anticipating our unusual modern way of processing information. Rather, their complex behaviors seem to have been a sort of incremental improvement on what earlier creatures had done in their lineage. Now, even Homo, um, Homo neanderthalensis, the best known of all uh, uh, extinct human relatives, can be basically described in the same terms. Neanderthals were the culmination of an endemic European lineage, very well represented here in Italy, that separated from our own African ancestors at some time over about half a million years ago. And they had brains as big as our brains are, although they were enclosed in uh, skulls of dis uh, very distinctively different shape, as you can see here in this image with a Neanderthal on the left and a modern human skull on the right. But again, despite a large archaeological legacy and recurrent claims to the uh, contrary, there is no unequivocal evidence that the Neanderthals were mentally processing information in the modern symbolic manner. Now, I've been characterized sometimes as a Neanderthal basher, and I want to emphasize I do not in the least wish to demean these large-brained hominids, who were clearly hardy, who were clearly resourceful, who were clearly, for a long time, very successful indeed. And they were also wonderful craftsmen, making stone tools like the ones you see on the screen here. But they evidently did not remake the world in their minds as we do. Even more amazingly though, the same thing appears to have been true of the very earliest anatomically recognizable Homo sapiens, which showed up in Africa at around 200,000 years ago. Significantly, these very early anatomically modern humans, like this one that we see here from Ethiopia, are found in archaic archaeological contexts that were broadly comparable to those of the uh, Neanderthals. And we have to wait around for a hundred thousand years before we start finding any evidence of symbolic thinking, of symbolic activity. Again, this innovation came in Africa. Among the material evidence for uh, the early workings of symbolic minds is this 75,000 year old geometrical pattern incised on a plaque of ochre. It comes from a site called Bombos Cave on the southern African coast. And nobody, as far as we know, had ever made an object like this before. And together with a lot of other evidence, things like this indicate that really significant change was in uh, uh, was oh, a little more distant? Okay, sorry, I'll, I shall try to be more distant. And um, along with a lot of other evidence, objects like this suggest that a significant behavioral change was already happening in Africa among hominids by around 100,000 years ago. And then after this, we don't have to uh, wait very long until at, at about 40,000 years ago, we find this behavioral revolution that's been hinted at already in Africa, we find it fully expressed in the amazing wall art of uh, Europe, uh, including places like, oops, have we lost our, uh, oh, there we go, thanks. Yeah, and uh, that we find fully expressed in the amazing wall art of caves in uh, in, uh, in, in Western Europe, uh, including this one at Chauvet in France. And simultaneously, we see it in the advent of music, as demonstrated by flutes like these ones from the Pyrenees. We see it in record keeping, such as this, these notations uh, made on a plaque from a site in southern France. And we see it also in some of the most delicate and elegant carvings ever made. These include these tiny, this tiny horse image 
from the uh, cave of Vogelhead in Germany, which is almost the earliest art object uh, that we know of. And as you can see, this is not a stolidly realist depiction of the chunky ponies that roamed the Ice Age steppes of Europe. But instead, it's an elegant abstraction of the graceful essence of the horse. This is abstract art. This is symbolic art, if you've ever seen it. Now, the huge transformation in the way of viewing the world that uh, such things imply paints a very eloquent picture for us, I think. Before those first stirrings of the symbolic spirit in Africa at about 100,000 years ago, both technological and anatomical innovation in human evolution had been highly sporadic. Responses to the well-known climatic and environmental instabilities of the Ice Ages seems typically to have involved using old tools for new uses, rather than the other way around as we do today. When we have a new exigency, we tend to invent something new to deal with it. But through the vast majority of uh, human evolution, basically people had made shift with old tools. They hadn't shown this, um, in, uh, this, uh, this inventiveness. And so with the, with the emergence of modern Homo sapiens, we, what we are seeing is a restless and totally uh, unprecedented appetite for change itself. In other words, for the very first time, change became the norm rather than uh, the exception. Stability in behavioral traditions went out the window. And to understand the qualities of this new phenomenon, it's important to remember that cognitively modern Homo sapiens is not simply an extrapolation of earlier trends. The archaeological record makes it pretty clear, I think, that we're not doing what our predecessors did, but just a little bit better. By mentally recreating the world, cognitively modern humans are truly doing something new and different and unprecedented in their minds. And because this radical innovation represents a total break with the past, we can't just explain it away by classic natural selection. After all, natural selection is not a, a creative process that can just conjure up novelties at will. So in that case, we have to ask ourselves, what happened? Well. We already know from the big-brained but uh, non-symbolic Neanderthals that our unique style of processing information is not simply a passive product of our large brain mass. The difference is clearly due to something structural in the brain, something that permits us to make complex associations between the outputs of multiple brain regions. Now, of course, until we know exactly how a mass of electrochemical signals in our brains becomes resolved into what we subjectively experience as our consciousness, we'll never properly or completely understand what that something is. But I do think that we can already see the general outlines of the historical framework within which the almost unimaginable transition from non-symbolic to symbolic consciousness occurred. Now, the human brain, which we see here, has a long and complex evolutionary history of accretion. This is an untidy but uh, very effective structure that evolved over millions of years of vertebrate evolution by the addition of new components and by changes in older ones. But its production of symbolic cognition only apparently occurred very abruptly and very late in its history. Indeed, this new way of thinking 
seems to have originated significantly after the origin of Homo sapiens as an anatomically distinctive entity. And hence, it clearly originated after the acquisition of the modern human brain. Now, I think, as I've hinted already, this actually shouldn't be very surprising to us, because both behavioral and presumed cognitive innovations have always typically been first expressed within the tenure of existing hominid species. And this knowledge, I think, makes it reasonable to conclude that the critical neural innovation, whatever it was, was acquired initially as a byproduct of the radical major developmental reorganization that gave rise to Homo sapiens as an anatomically distinctive entity at around 200,000 years ago. We're very different from the closest uh, relative that we can, uh, that we can identify in nature. There was something major in terms of developmental reorganization that happened at the base of our species. And in other words, the key innovation that permits symbolic thought arose as an exaptation rather than as an adaptation. And while it uh, provided the biological substrate for symbolic cognition, the new potential that this structure offered lay fallow until it was released somehow through the action of what had to have been a cultural stimulus. And I think, and uh, others will certainly disagree with me, that this is where language entered the picture. Because the invention of language is the best candidate that we have for this releasing factor, for this provoking factor. After all, language is the ultimate symbolic activity. Indeed, for us, language is virtually synonymous with thought. Because exactly like thought, language involves forming and manipulating symbols in the mind. And our capacity for a symbolic reasoning is almost unconceivable in its absence. Imagination and creativity are part of the same thing. They're part of the same process. Because only once we've created symbols in our mind can we combine those symbols in new ways and ask those what-if questions that are so important to us and our identity. And what is more, if language came along after Homo sapiens anatomy was already established, then the first linguistic people obviously already possessed exactively the vocal apparatus that was necessary to express it. We just don't need to figure out how the speech-adapted vocal tract managed to choreograph its appearance in the human lineage. It was already there. Now, such an origin would, by the way, uh, have been entirely routine in evolutionary terms. After all, think about it. The ancestors of birds had feathers for millions of years before they ever used them to fly, before they discovered that they could use them to fly. And finally, unlike other putative drivers of uh, symbolic thought processes, Language is also an externalized attribute. It's an attribute thus that is likely to spread uh, rapidly within a population that is biologically already enabled for it. And this remains true even if language is not most important as a means of communication, but rather most significant as an interior conduit to symbolic thought. So in any event, it seems very highly probable that it was symbolic thought that made Homo sapiens an insuperable competitor 
at some time in the period following about 100,000 years ago. And that ultimately led to our lonely state in the world. Our entire competition having been eliminated in a very short time. Now, intuitive, non-symbolic reasoning of the old kind can certainly take you a long way. And indeed, I think we can look upon the very considerable achievements of the Neanderthals as the ultimate example of what sophisticated intuition can do. But there is very little doubt, in my mind anyway, that it is symbolic thought that above all differentiates us from the Neanderthals as from all of our other extinct relatives. Although I know not all of my colleagues are going to agree with this. And I think the fact that we have this unique information processing ability does go a long way toward explaining why we are here today and our extinct relatives are not. So, to summarize, our unique cognition is an amazingly recent acquisition. And it was evidently the immediate product of a, of a short-term and probably random event, even though it capitalized on the fruits of hundreds of millions of years of vertebrate evolution. And in turn, this suggests the answer to the question I raised earlier. It suggests that we human beings have not been programmed by eons of natural selection to be what we are today. In, it seems to me <clears throat> also that knowing this fact is incredibly important because it allows us to understand better, I think, the kind of creature that we are. It helps us to understand why our decision-making processes are typically so messy. It shows us why our behaviors are so frequently irrational and self-destructive. And it helps us to understand why the human psyche itself is so famously murky and uh, impenetrable. And thank you all for your attention.